Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending on where you are. My name is Steve Sand. I'm the director of the SOAS China Institute. Let me first of all welcome you all on behalf of the SOAS China Institute to our annual debate. As some of you will have noticed, there was a break last year when we did not hold our debate. And this will be our first and hopefully our last or only online debate. I look forward to being able to see you physically at SOAS next year. This debate is being recorded. Events in 2020, the same events that make it impossible for us to hold the debate last year, point to one thing. However, the pandemic might have started and notwithstanding the fact that China was the first major victim of COVID-19 and the first to lock down, it has bounced back, apparently stronger. Over, over the last two decades or so, we have had various predictions of China collapsing. Most of them have come and gone. Whatever one thinks about the system in place in China, China under the Communist Party remains strong, increasingly powerful, and is still growing fast, albeit not at the breakneck speed of say a decade or so ago. And flashing back to about a decade ago, one cannot but be reminded by the words of the then premier Wang Jiabao, who talked about China's economic trajectory as, in, quote, in his words, unstable, unbalanced, uncoordinated, and unsustainable. Indeed, on the challenges that China faces, there are plenty. For example, the middle income trap, the shift from having a demographic uh, bonus to facing a demographic deficit, the uh, unfolding decoupling between China and the West, which will substantially reduce China's capacity to benefit from globalization, and the reality that China has already developed, uh, de delivered an economic miracle longer than any country has ever done in human history, and no country has ever sustained that level of growth forever. The list goes on. But on the positive side, we are also seeing that China now has genuinely globally competitive companies that are truly innovative. Something that we perhaps would be rather hesitant to say, say even just a decade ago. However, we are seeing the economy slowing, the momentum of growth is still ongoing. And China under Xi Jinping has made enormous changes trying to confront the kind of problems that we all saw and were identified by Wen Jiabao. Now, whether the Xi Jinping reforms will deliver the results he has hoped for remains to be seen. But the earlier predictions that the very heart of retarianism and his very strong focus on the state-owned sector will damage the economy has not yet come to pass, or at least not yet. Well, this is of course at least to the focus of our debate today, which is about whether China can sustain its economic rise. And for the debate, we have four very distinguished economists who have experienced not only in academia, but also in the world of financial services. Um, Professor 
Yong Ding Yu will open the debate speaking in support of the statement that China will sustain its economic rights. He will be followed by George Magnus and Professor Barry Norton, who will voice skepticism. Professor Xiaolan Feng Fu will make the closing remarks in favor of the statement. Each of them will have up to eight minutes for their opening remarks. I will then direct them to engage in conversations before opening the floor to everyone. If you would like to raise a question or make a comment, please use the Q&A box. Please also say who you are and where you are so that everybody knows how to contextualize your questions. Let me now introduce them one by one in the order of speaking. Yong Ding Yu is a fellow of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. He's also a member of many government advisory committees in China including having served as a member of the Monetary Policy Committee. He was amongst the first generation of economists from China who went to Oxford in the 1980s. And he spent his time at Oxford, I think altogether six years and earned a PhD or rather DPhil in economics. He has served as the Director General of the Institute of World Economics and Politics at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. And has published and edited more than 10 books and countless articles. One of the most distinguished economists in contemporary China, in my view. Um, George Magnus is a research associate at the SOAS China Institute and also a former chief economist at UBS. He's also a research associate at the Oxford China Center. He is, in my assessment, unquestionably one of the most thoughtful practicing economists in the financial services sector. And also one who has great insights on the structural and political challenges that China faces. He has been credited with having identified the trigger point leading to the global financial crisis and with helping us to understand its impact. He is the author of three powerful and highly readable books, the most recent and most directly relevant to today's debate is Red, Fla Red Flags, Why Xi Jinping's China is in Jeopardy. Barry Norton is the So Guan Lok Professor at the School of Global Policy and Strategy, University of California, San Diego. His name should be one that is familiar to anyone who has taken any course on Chinese economy, because I'm sure colleagues uh, of mine anywhere would choose to nominate some of Barry's publications in the reading list. Renowned for his insights on China's market transition, industry and technology, foreign trade and political economy, his first book, Growing Out of the Plan, won the O'Hara Prize in 1996. His, I think his second book, The Chinese Economy, Adaptation and Growth, was reissued with a new edition in 2018. He is currently working on a new book on China's industrial policy. Xiaolan Fu is Professor of Technology and International Development at Oxford University and a fellow of Green Templeton College there. She's also the founding director of the Technology and Management Center for Development at Oxford. She had worked in the business world in China before she joined academia and therefore able to provide a views both on the business side and the academic side. She plays an advisory role to 
various governments and international NGOs. Too many for me to mention them uh, in all. Her academic articles have won again multiple awards, so I'm not going to list them all. She's the author of, as far as I know, four fantastic books, the most recent of which is Innovation Under the Radar, which came out last year. The book which I think bears most immediately on today's debate is China's Path to Innovation, which came out in 2015. Now let the debate begin. Over to you, Yong Ding, Professor Yu. Thank you. Thank you for your kind introduction. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a good honor. Uh, my opening remarks uh, will be very short. Uh, my view is very uh, clear. Uh, in short run, Chinese economy is quite good. Actually, uh, Chinese economy has uh, recovered very strongly since the last quarter of uh, 2020. In the first quarter of the 2021, the growth rate of the Chinese economy was 18.3%, extremely high, of course. This, to a very large extent, is attributable to so-called base effect. Then in the, third, in the second, third, and the fourth quarter, the growth rate will fall steadily to something like 8%, 7%, 6%, and so forth. On the whole, for 2021, China's uh, GDP growth rate would be something between 8% to 9%. I think it's quite remarkable achievement, which shows Chinese economy is quite resilient. Uh, government actually uh, is quite cautious and so they are in a hurry, try to normalize fiscal and monetary policy because they think uh, the growth uh, is already very strong. My personal view is that uh, China's uh, growth is still under its uh, potential growth rate. So China should continue to use eventually physical and monetary policy uh, to consolidate the achievement so far we have achieved. One of the very important lessons we should learn from history and from other countries is that China should not exit too early. And this is my basic position. Uh, but uh, this is a minority view in China. Most economists in China would argue that China's growth rate is already very high. So we must pay greater attention to inflation and uh, assets bubble. So we should exit as early as possible. But uh, my view is different. And Steve just talk about China's uh, long-term prospect. I think there should be no, uh, no problem for China to maintain a relatively high growth rate. Uh, there should be no problem for China to escape middle income trap unless we are stupid, unless we are going to make mistakes which are not necessary. Uh, I think even though there are lots of uh, negative uh, factors which may have a negative impact on China's long-term growth, but at the same time, we can see lots of uh, positive factors which we are working to offset those negative impact. For example, aging is a big problem for China. But on the other hand, China's urbanization rate is still low, something like 60% compared with the Japan's 90%. Most advanced countries, 80%. China still have a long way to go during urbanization policies. I think China's labor productivity may improve. What I'm trying to say is that why we have to see there are lots of problems, lots of ne negative uh, factors which will suppress China's growth potential. But at the same time, uh, there are also positive factors. So the key is the right policy. 
If we don't have a right policy, then we will fail. But as long as we are wise enough to adopt the right policy, all those problems can be overcome. I don't want to talk about uh, long term too much because I am a believer of Keynes. We always remember his famous uh, phrase, in the long run, we all are dead. So I'm not going to talk about it 20 years later, 30 years, 30 years later. Uh, I'm already uh, old enough, 70 something. So I don't think I will live so long uh, to wait to be uh, verified. But uh, basically, I'm optimistic about the Chinese economy. I think Chinese economy, as long as we can avoid making unnecessary mistakes, will be sustainable. It will grow. Of course, I'm not talking about China will take over the United States as the number one. I don't think that's very likely. But at least China will become a very strong country, a prosperous country in the world. I have a 100% confidence in this. I think I can end here. So I'm prepared to engage in debate with uh, our friends. All these four panelists are my old friends. 20 years, 30 years, 10 years at least. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yu. Uh, George, over to you. Uh, thanks, Steve, and, um, and also for hosting uh, today. Um, I'd like to make uh, three points, I think, about why I, I have a problem with the idea about China's um, current uh, economic rise as commonly understood as to why that is uh, sustainable. So we should remember, I think, that there, there is no historical precedent, really, for countries to enjoy uninterrupted economic expansion uh, without bumping into balance sheet constraints or indeed for highly authoritarian governance regimes to break the so-called middle income trap. And my view is that China is at the tail end of a remarkable long expansion uh, that's already given off some warning signs in 2013, 2015, and just before the pandemic. Of course, it remains ever true, uh, as Yongding has just uh, outlined, that China could, of course, be exceptional and prove skeptics like me uh, completely wrong. But if so, I think, as he said, it has to be on the basis of sound policy and reform, and not on the basis of what spreadsheets say uh, or a leap of faith. So my first point really is that China is almost certainly at what I call the, the end of extrapolation, right? So there are a lot of things that China has done so successfully in the past in a crusade of pragmatic reform. Uh, but most of these things can only be done once or have limited further potential as things stand. And I'm thinking here about moving labor from low productivity agriculture to high productivity manufacturing, enrolling all your children in school, joining the WTO, basic property rights, privatization, uh, creating the world's biggest housing market, uh, private housing market, and uh, importantly, introducing uh, rules-based governance and institutions. These policies paid huge dividends for China in the form of total factor productivity. And, and we certainly can, looking back, associate periods of accelerating TFP with policies of reform and opening up. Uh, unfortunately, both TFP and reform have stalled in recent years. The World Bank in a recent study estimated that TFP had only grown by about 0.7% per annum in the decade to 2018. It had held up pretty well in business, but not so much in housing, government and infrastructure where it had actually stalled or declined. And of course, these are exactly the sectors that the government has tended to rely on and pump credit into every time the economy needed a boost. Now, of course, the acid test of the 14th five-year plan and of uh, dual currency, dual circulation strategy at its heart um, is really whether policymakers can bite the bullet or will bite the bullet on the kind of reform intensity required to strengthen productivity growth over the medium term. And that holds the key, I think, as to whether China can avoid the so-called middle income trap, which leaders have warned about in the past, but very few people speak about it now in China, uh, as a matter of fact. 
The second point I'd like to write, make is that China's development models also needs to overcome some important structural headwinds or red flags as I've labeled them. And I'll, I'll only highlight them very briefly, of course, and I won't even mention the technology capacity in deference to comments which Barry and Xiaolan are going to make uh, shortly. So the first red flag is debt. Um, China's predominantly domestically owned and owed debt uh, and state-owned banking system means I think that it can avoid a Lehman type outcome or an Argentine type crisis. But with total debt at over three times GDP and rising, a steady stream of misallocated capital and bad debt stories, bank runs, bank restructurings, a rising volume of credit events among bond issuers, SOEs, local government finance vehicles and property developers, it's quite clear that China is facing elevated financial stress, uh, the upshot of which will be uh, significantly lower growth. I think this is the whirlwind that's being reaped after credit and financial system assets have grown so much faster than GDP for so many years, leading to systemic uh, misallocation of credit and now exposing the limits of debt capacity for many borrowers. So I think the, the growth in debt and financial assets is unsustainable. And even many regulators acknowledge that the damaging effects of inadequate pricing of risk and the system of implicit guarantees are both uh, big constraints. It's a difficult path for the regulators and officials to tread uh, because they have to balance lower growth, rising defaults, weak funding structure of the liabilities of banks outside of the big five and the sensitivity of the financial system uh, to balance two uh, interest rates which are uh, possibly likely to go up at some point. So whether now or in the next few years, addressing endemic financial stability, I think is going to be a very important factor which will uh, bring slower growth and possibly financial repression, more financial repression and downward pressure on the exchange rate. Demographics is the second uh, red flag. The, obviously the controversy last week over whether China's population has peaked 10 years earlier than expected speaks to two possibilities. One is far fewer young women in the population than people thought and the other is much lower total fertility. Uh, both possibly uh, have been at work. And it underscores the speed of aging in China and of the working age population decline. As uh, Scott Rosell and Natalie Hell have um, shown in their excellent new book, Invisible China, poor high school educational attainment levels in the labor force, much lower than in most countries that have been in a middle income trap for a long time, are a major drag on the country and a warning about self-limiting progress. And the third red flag is, is the middle income trap itself, which I think is essentially about the quality of institutions needed to underpin productivity growth and innovation. Um, so we know that authoritarian governments are very good at some things, but they tend not to be greater. Things like competition, incentives, financial systems that harness and uh, allocate capital efficiently. And they also tend to lack inclusive and adaptive competition, regulatory and legal institutions they usually feature quite successfully in development models where societies can extract greater value from investment and workers can operate at higher levels of efficiency. So I think this third point about institutional and governance set uh, conditions is a concern, um, particularly with the new edgier emphasis on state in institutions and the party uh, as uh, leading uh, all. And of course, the example of Alibaba and Jack Ma uh, proving or demonstrating really this um, very curious condition which uh, private entrepreneurs and private enterprise are in at the moment. So conformity and control uh, may be very effective politically, but you have to wonder if China isn't handicapping itself when it comes to entrepreneurship and true innovation. Now, I think that on that note, I'm going to finish, um, but by only mentioning my view that a true innovation is, uh, is you know, unlike science and engineering, I think is a is primarily a business activity that values know-how, understanding of competitive markets, design, finance, and management. And I think these are areas in which existing policies, I think, will hold China back. Thank you. Thank you very much, George. Over to you, Barry. Uh, Barry, you're unmuted. Thanks. Forgot, always forgetting to turn the mute off. Um, thanks very much. This is, uh, of course, we're in a debate, so we're supposed to argue about things, 
Uh, but I must say, after listening to the first two speakers, I'm impressed by how reasonable and logical both of them were. And so I'm going to come in uh, actually agreeing with a lot of what both of them said, but then argue that when we pay attention to a few more things, it's going to tilt the balance away from confidence in the sustainability of China's growth and give us a greater awareness of some of the accumulating problems that we really see building up. And I certainly agree with Yongding's initial point, right, that as long as China follows the right policies, as long as China follows common sense policies, its growth will be sustainable. And in that case, we'll see China naturally taking on a leadership role in, among the countries of the earth. And that's what we want to see. That's certainly what I want to see. But unfortunately, it's not what we're seeing right now. The economic policy package that China is following today is short-sighted and ineffective. Worse, it's in danger of becoming more ineffective as China steps up the intensity of its industrial policies in particular and finds itself increasingly and inevitably in conflict with the other countries of the world. Let's go back 12 years because really the beginning of the current set of policies starts with the global financial crisis in 2008-2009. We all know what happened then. China stepped up. It ramped up its investment to unprecedented levels so that China has been investing over 42% of gross domestic product in new capital every year since 2009. Now that's an astonishing thing. Nobody has ever done anything like that in the past. It's completely unprecedented. The US and the UK both invest about 20% of GDP. There's no reason that has to be the norm, but no other country comes anywhere close to what China is doing. So in other words, the, the fundamental macroeconomic context of China's growth strategy is to pour resources into new fixed capital, is to take an economy that's still quite poor. Yes, it's middle income, but just barely middle income. If you look at GDP per capita in purchasing power parity terms, China is about a quarter of the US. But remember, this immense investment effort means that consumption is a smaller share of China's economy. So per capita consumption in China, even valued at purchasing power parities, is about one seventh what it is in the United States. So there's still lots of developmental challenges, some of which George mentioned just a second ago, the fact that about half of the elementary school children in the countryside are not getting adequate education and are not uh, in schools that are adequately funded by the government. So when we look at China's development strategy, it is overwhelmingly one of pouring in massive investment. And as again, as George mentioned, productivity growth simultaneously has dropped. It's not just one World Bank study. Multiple studies by Chinese and foreign economists agree that about the time the strategy shifted, China's annual productivity growth dropped by two or more full percentage points per year. That's a lot of foregone productivity growth, which builds up as capital that is unable to uh, play its full role. Now, when we focus on industrial policy, we see the same kind of outcome in sectoral outcomes. For instance, semiconductor industry. How much has China, how much has the Chinese government spent on trying to foster the semiconductor industry? Estimates vary, but at least $250 billion in government subsidized uh, investments and other kinds of protective support. And yet, has the gap between the cutting edge of the global semiconductor industry been reduced by China catching up? Absolutely not. In fact, by some measures, it's slightly increased. And more importantly, China has sent this crucial message 
that it will do almost anything to acquire semiconductor technology. And therefore, companies around the world have less incentive to cooperate. They're more worried about their intellectual property. And a whole series of problems have been exposed in the last year, including most notably the collapse of a multi-billion dollar project, uh, the Wuhan Hongxin factory. And yet, China is increasing its commitment to these policies with over a trillion dollars worth of industrial guidance funds. Now look, if China wants to waste billions of dollars, it can do so. The real problem is that this kind of developmental focus diverts attention from many other things that need to be done. Take a quick look at China's fiscal system. Five years ago, eight years ago, we were told that China was about to reform its fiscal system. And yet somehow none of those policies actually got rolled out after the initial wave. The result is China still has a fiscal system that remarkably does nothing to improve income distribution. In other words, the tax system has no progressivity at all. Even the US tax system significantly lowers the US Gini coefficient. But all the studies show that the Chinese tax system doesn't lower the Gini coefficient at all. It doesn't provide adequate revenue to local governments. It certainly doesn't provide resources for the retirement system which is gonna run out of reserves in a few years. And my third and final point is that the policy orientation that China is already on is creating momentum that's pushing the country further into a dead end of increasing government control and decreasing international exchange. Yu Yongding mentioned that monetary policy is relatively tight right now. Why? Because it's so necessary to maintain financial discipline over these enormous number of shoddy projects set up under the auspices of industrial policy. But that has subsidiary costs elsewhere, keeping small and private firms from getting access to, to low cost capital. And when we look at the 14th five-year plan, we see all these tendencies reinforced by the steps that are being taken in the 14th five-year plan. I'm very worried about China's current policy orientation. China has the potential to do spectacularly well when it's moving in the direction of less government control and more openness. But currently, China's going exactly the opposite direction. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Barry. Um, let me now, invite uh, Xiaolan, Professor Fu. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for organizing this debate. I think this is a time we need dialogue. Uh, so uh, yeah, thanks for organizing all this. And uh, my argument is that despite the various challenges, China's economic development is sustainable. Uh, China has made an important change in its development strategy to transit from an input-driven growth model to an innovation-driven uh, development strategy. I will examine um, the sustainability of China's uh, economic rise from uh, innovation and the technology perspective. I will start uh, with some facts. Uh, China's R&D spending now ranked number two in the world and grow at a speed of double digit. China has maintained the world's largest pool of R&D personnel since 2013, accounted for about 20% of the world's total uh, R&D manpower. Last year, 2020, China ranked number one in PCT patent applications uh, uh, and accounted for 25% of the world's total PCT, which is international patent application. And the China's investment in green R&D has been number one in the world since 2013. And its publications and the patents in artificial intelligence ranked uh, number two in the world, followed the US, United States. The private sector have been um, 
important and the leading players in China's innovation. The famous companies most are the private ones, Huawei, Tencent, Alibaba, TikTok, Xiaomi, etc. The country now is upgrading uh, from mainly depend on foreign technology transfer to what I call an open national innovation system 2.0, which is characterized by knowledge core production and still keep up, you know, open, open, opening up and also enhanced indigenous innovation at the same time. So all this data and the facts suggest China is catching up quickly, although it still lagged behind the United States considerably. Can China develop its technological capabilities for sustained economic growth? Uh, I will answer um, three key questions. Um, uh, just share with you my, my views. Uh, first, we, will China fall as a result of the geopolitical tension and uh, uh, technological decoupling? Admittedly, this technological decoupling will cost all countries, including China and, and the US. However, will China fall? My answer is a no. Uh, look at history. Wherever the US imposed sanctions or restrictions, in those areas, China developed its own technological capability uh, gradually, although it's slower, much slower than the US, but it managed to achieve it. Um, and the one example is the China's space exploration program, uh, China's uh, mission um, to the Mars, to the moon, and the recently launched the space station are good example. Secondly, can China create radical innovation uh, and break through the middle income trap. Radical innovation normally are created through two uh, channels. One is interest and curiosity driven, free exploration. And another is problem driven R&D, uh, um, research and development. When existing knowledge does not provide a good effective answer, people have to find novel solutions. And the China is currently emphasizing problem-oriented innovation strategy, although it has limitations in the first uh, uh, interest curiosity-driven free uh, uh, exploration. So by emphasizing problem-oriented innovation, China will be able to create some, produce some radical innovation and original knowledge contribute to the world through this road. And also China has, we, we should not underestimate some of China's capability in institutional innovation. It has created a market economy with Chinese uh, socialist uh, characteristics. Maybe we will see democracy with Chinese characteristics one day uh, because we have to recognize the cultural differences too uh, uh, between countries. Thirdly, is China's innovation model fundamentally wrong because China has a strong state? Innovation takes place in an innovation system, including firms, universities and research institutions, and the state. That's, uh, that's the national innovation system, widely framework, widely accepted and also applied in most of the countries. There is a role of the state, although different countries the, the role of the state may take place in different ways and to dif different extent. Uh, in fact, like even in the United States, um, the state also have played a very important role through heavy investment into the defense system through the NASA or National Science Foundation and the knowledge transfers from the public sector to the private sector like SpaceX. SpaceX is a new company as has a bit uh, Boeing uh, in, in some of the competition. It, the capability of SpaceX does not come naturally because it has a, a, a genius, very innovative CEO, because a lot of knowledge transfer from NASA, from the public sector to SpaceX. Uh, so um, of course for China, it should, should uh, let the market and the private sector firms to play a much more important role in its innovation. So conclude, 
uh, China will become an innovative country and its economic development will be sustainable. It is on the way to development and it's improving, improving at a speed faster than many other countries. I agree with some of the limitations that my fellow colleagues has correctly pointed out. So if China want to be the world's number one innovator in the world, it needs first not only continue, but to accelerate the reform and opening up and the deeper marketization to create a fair and open market. This will make China a country that the world, many, the rest of the world will like it and will follow it. This is good for China too, to use, allocate and use the resources efficiently. And secondly, China should improve the innovation environment developed a market of ideas and make China a place where free and creative thinking is encouraged and the intellectual property is very well protected. Uh, that's all from me. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Shaolan, and indeed to all four of you for your very nuanced and thoughtful um, presentations. Um, let me try to get used to engage even more with each other's uh, pawns. If I, if I may, um, I will put the first set of questions to um, Professor Yu and Professor Fu based on the pawns that are being made from uh, George and Barry, and then I'll go the other way around. I think the thing that I pick up from George and from Barry is that Yes, China has potential that is ac accepted, acknowledged, and huge changes. But the current direction of travel in terms of policy is not guiding China in the right lane of policy that will take it to the destination it needs to go. If anything, it is in the wrong lane which is creating more problems and therefore not allowing China to fully utilize its potential. So what would be your responses, um, uh, Yongding and Xiaolan? And then I'll go to the other way. I think uh, we need uh, to be more specific. And uh, I think uh, both uh, uh, George and Barry raised some uh, very legitimate questions. Actually, I think we can uh, uh, answer the challenges one by one, but of course, due to time constraint, I just uh, pick up some of them. For example, George worry about China's uh, leverage ratio, high debt, okay? I have been worried about this for more than 20 or 30 years. Actually, uh, I think uh, me and uh, George exchanging notes 10 years ago, something about uh, the trajectory of uh, debt, right? I remember you wrote a paper, a very good paper. And um, I think, yes, uh, China's uh, liberty ratio is extremely high, but uh, I don't think it will stop China's economic growth. And actually, only with relatively high, decent economic growth, then we can solve the debt problem. We can lower the liberty ratio by uh, increase growth rate. And there are two ways. Of course, you can uh, cut the debt. Uh, then uh, perhaps because you uh, cut debt, uh, you get a lower growth rate. Then the leverage ratio will rise rather than fall. And I'm not that worried about the so-called high leverage ratio. I have at least uh, 10 reasons. I don't have time to name all of them. I just name a few. For example, China is a very high saving country still very high. Barry just said uh, China has very high saving ratio, uh, investment rate. Uh, this is a result of high saving. China is a high saving country, still a high saving country. And China has very high growth rate compared with other countries. China has few foreign debt. China has huge state assets. Uh, China's major banks are state owned. We don't need to worry about the bank run, and we don't need to uh, nationalize those banks, like in UK about this uh, Northern Rock. They are already state-owned. And uh, also, uh, 
Chinese capital control. You can't run away from China to other countries. And also China's exchange rate has, has become much more flexible. This is a very good uh, defense for maintaining the stability, financial stability, and also uh, other, at least 10 or even more. I don't have time to name them. What I'm trying to say that, yes, we should worry about this, but I don't think this will become uh, a, a, a sort of a insurmountable obstacle to Chinese economic growth. I learned this from Japan. In 1996, when I visited the Minister of Finance of Japan, I was told at the time, Japan's debt, public debt of GDP ratio was 92%, it's too high, much too high. So they introduced a policy of a restructure of that restructuring of a, a physical, a physical position. It's called, uh, I, I forgot the name of this is a, a Japan's policy. They raise the income tax, uh, consumption tax. The result is the worsening of leverage ratio. So my view is that yes, China has problem, debt problem, but we don't need to worry too much about that. And more importantly, the right way to solve this is to maintain a high growth rate. And I think this is the one uh, response to, uh, to, 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 uh, to George's worry. And, uh, and just now, uh, Barry mentioned about China's extremely high investment rate. Actually, I think we need to, we need to check, check figures. My memory is that since 2000, 2012, the growth rate for China's fixed assets investment has been dropping gradually, steadily. Over the past few years, the growth rate of fixed assets investment is much less, much lower than growth rate GDP. So the share of the fixed assets investment in GDP is not that high. We, we can check that. Maybe we have given a source. We have given a source of data. But my, my, my understanding is that the Chinese fixed assets investment is not that high. You, you are right, 10 years ago, but not, not right now. And there are others, but to, for the time to check, I stop here. Well, thank you. Uh, Shannon. I would just uh, build upon what uh, Yong Ding has mentioned. First is about current direction of travel. I think one, tra one direction I think is the one that everybody expects and is really what the Chinese government has done and stick to is opening up. Opening up, uh, you know, uh, although may not to the, to the uh, uh, very high speed that others expect, I think opening up the economy, opening up uh, uh, trade, foreign investment, and also uh, international collaboration. This has been, I think, looking at the policy changes and the China's continue to host the import exhibition and also China's uh, efforts in promoting uh, research collaboration. I think this is something that they are uh, very uh, firm in, in, in pushing forward. Uh, and the one thing that um, um, like both uh, uh, Barry and, uh, and George has mentioned uh, is the uh, increasing government uh, control. Um, I think in practice, what I have observed is that people is trying to manage to promote innovation uh, and the variety of ideas under the current institutional framework, like they are encouraging problem solving uh, innovation strategy. So overcome the global challenges and the China's uh, the various challenges, including the trade sanctions, et cetera. Um, uh, and all these problems becomes, you know, questions that will motivate the researchers to, to keep on innovate. And uh, about industrial policy, I think um, Barry's worry about semiconductor sector, I actually, I, I, I very much worry about it too, uh, about this industry. I don't think semiconductor in industry, China's capability will be built upon by, by heavy investment. Uh, I also worry, however, I also observe that most of the China's s and T, the science and technology innovation policy now focus on research and development, uh, on promoting basic research on building the scientific and the research, research infrastructure. They are in other sectors, 
uh, they are more kind of uh, you know uh, uh, moving towards let the market to uh, allocate the resources. At least they are very clear in their mind. However, pushed by the trade war, sometimes people you know lose forget about this principle, especially like in the semiconductor industry. But overall, I see government more and more moving to, to the public research uh, uh, um, uh, area. And about China's overall growth, uh, the GDP, uh, uh, TFP growth, George and Barry both mentioned the de decrease of the uh, TFP growth. Uh, I also uh, look, read, I have also read the, the World Bank report. I think this is an outcome of First is the uh, stimulus package since 20, uh, 2009, and this heavy investment dragged down the TFP growth. However, if we really look at the individual firms, then we can see, you know, at the ind individual firm level rather than macro level, we will see the TFP growth in many of the Chinese firms have increased mm -hmm. and driven by technological innovation. Um, however, I think diffusion, diffusion of technology uh, uh, and innovation from the leading firms to the rest of the economy, still a very important task for China. Uh, although um, now people focus on groundbreaking innovation, I think this diffusion of innovation um, for government, they still need to pay a lot of attention to the diffusion. Thank you. Um, let me now put the something I picked up from uh, Yongding and Xiaolan's presentation and put it to George and Barry. I think the under, underlines that China's actually is under underutilizing its potential, one of which that Xiaolan has picked up is in terms of the innovation side of China's potentials and investment. And I think implicit in there is perhaps a kind of potential new paradigm, which is that the concentration of power that Xi Jinping has brought about will give China more scope to implement policies that it, other systems simply could not possibly do. Now, I'm not quite sure whether both Xiaolan and Yongding would push quite as far as that, but that is implicitly there. So the question that I want to put to you, uh, Barry and George, is do you see that? Do you see the innovation as a salvation to China's economy? Uh, Xiaolan having acknowledged that decoupling will have negative effect, but it will be having negative effect across the board, not only on China. And that capacity is to mobilize resources and put them all at the disposal of the innovation part of the economy would be the ones to break the logjam for China. Do you buy that or not? Uh, who would you like to come first, Barry or George? Why don't I go first? Because I, um, we started off so congenially, but now I think now is the time to disagree. Uh, so first, let me start with you, Steve. No, I completely disagree with that. The idea that big centralized control over industrial policy, over research and development is going, to, is going to be good for the Chinese economy? Absolutely not. It's the opposite. Uh, Xiaolan mentioned a couple of times that China has these very excellent private firms. That's absolutely true. And when you look at every one of these most dynamic, most innovative firms, what you discover in their background is intense collaboration with foreigners whether it's in capital raising, venture capital, key scientists who come in. I'm not saying that makes China passive, quite the contrary. It's a mutual collaboration that is just is so productive, was one of the most dynamic things shaping the global economy in the 20th and early 21st century. Those are the kinds of activities that are being squashed by this over-concentration on government activity. Shalom points out, hey, government has a legitimate role in innovation. Of course, that's absolutely right, right? Funding basic research, procuring uh, things like spaceships in both countries. Um, absolutely, there, I don't think there are any, you know, there are no atheists in foxholes. There are no neoliberals on this particular debate. Nobody is saying the Chinese government doesn't have a role to play. The problem is 
the role the Chinese government is playing today is clumsy, heavy handed and squeezing out genuine innovative activity as well as squeezing out consumption. Yongding, you, you questioned the investment data, but I think it's absolutely unambiguous. The reason the fixed asset investment figures appear to be not increasing year to year is because the figure had become so inaccurate that the Statistical Bureau has started successively revising them. And they specifically say that the year to year data are not comparable. But you go to the GDP accounts and you see the net fixed investment, net capital, new fixed capital, growth of inventories, then the new fixed capital has been above 42% every single year since 2009. I don't think there's any ambiguity in that whatsoever. And so, you know, I would just say the last thing, opening up, you think China is opening up? I mean, the 14 five years plan says very, very clearly, number one, science and technology, right? Self-reliance in science and technology. Is that consistent with the global enterprise of science? They say, we're going to examine, audit all of our production channels. And therefore, we're going to invest in the weak links so that we can be independent of global manufacturing production networks. That's not a message of opening that China is sending to the outside world. It's sending a message of self-reliance and security above everything else. Uh, George. Yeah, I don't want to <clears throat> over-repeat what Barry's just uh, said. I mean, I, I would say just as a general point, I mean, I think we, we do agree I think if I can speak for both of us with uh, Shalan and, and with um, Yongding that, you know, of course, if China pursues the right policies, emphasizes markets, you know, encourages, I think uh, Shalan talked about uh, free and creative thinking, opening up, of course, these things, we, we would all be singing from the same hymn book. I think our problem is, or my problem certainly is that politically, something has changed um, very dramatically in the last decade. Um, and the China that we see today and that we're trying to think about for the coming years in the future, you know, it's not the same China that we knew before 2010, 2012. So, uh, you know, the, um, what, well, you know, when we look at, say, for example, the dual circulation strategy, which is, you know, it, it, it appears to be a very kind of organized kind of structural approach to um, you know, an economic strategy in a, in a very different and very harsh external economic environment. But it is about um, the same kind of uh, domestic focus on supply chains as maybe, you know, the Americans and the Europeans have now. It is about import substitution. It is about emphasizing domestic production and, um, and uh, kind of de-Americanizing or certainly decoupling from uh, some of those kind of external relationships. The opening up, I mean, where I would say the same kind of rhetorical questions, you know, where's the opening up in service? Where's the, except maybe for uh, some limited opening up to American firms in finance, there's no real kind of opening up in services, no opening up in terms of cap outward capital controls, no opening up for um, tax reform, uh, income distribution, um, none of the uh, kind of, uh, sort of emphasis of, of kind of, inclusive institutions which we think are kind of necessary to sustain growth and my final point really is to re-emphasize what I thought was a point I, I only briefly made before which is to con, you know, to avoid the conflation of invention and innovation so research and development patents by the way China is also now a world leader in patent retraction not just creation but patent retraction um, so these things, and nobody denies that, you know, that China is very good at doing science and engineering, you know, to send uh, spaceships to the dark side or the far side of the moon. I mean, that's, let's not be churlish. That's a, a huge effort and a major um, um, uh, kind of scientific achievement. But innovation, I always think is something that's completely different from that. Innovation is about businesses and markets and, um, um, extending 
the, the thrust of new of product, in, of product processes and scientific processes to the boring bits of the economy that you rarely get a mention. Um, and of uh, emphasizing things like commercialization and branding and um, trying to sort of leverage really um, reputation, not reputation, but I mean, obviously economic success from, uh, from doing all of these things. So my, my issue in a kind of putting into a bottom line context really is that I, I don't believe these things can't be done. They're not beyond the wit of anybody to try to do this. It's just that I think the political structure and the governance structure that's now in place, I think is a huge drag on its capacity to do this. Uh, so in my book, you know, I, I talked about red flags of being about cease China in jeopardy. Anybody else's China might be just fine, but I just think this one is not the right one. Thank you, George. Uh, Yong Ding, I think you'd like to come in. Uh, I, I, will, I will invite you to do so, okay. and then I will open it uh, to the questions from the floor. Professor Yu. Um, I, I think I should uh, respond to uh, the claim by uh, George and Barry about uh, China's uh, tending into inward looking or closing up its door. I think we need to uh, study the causality. I think uh, in 19, uh, in, sorry, in 2007, China's total trade over GDP ratio is 64%. Uh, China's export to GDP ratio is 35%. And China's uh, uh, trade surplus uh, is something like 9%. That is big time, extremely high. So at that time, I argued that uh, China's uh, growth is imbalanced. China cannot pursue this kind of uh, blandly uh, export-led strategy because the Chinese can't become larger and larger. So if you export, that means you you uh, shock the global market. So you should try best to run a more balanced trade account. I've been arguing this for more than maybe something like 20 years. And actually, I think the Chinese government started to make this kind of arrangement in early 80s, it's right policy, uh, also, uh, 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 export led because the Chinese economy is very small. 11 behind Holland, Netherlands, very small, account just uh, a few percentage of a global economy but now you become very large. So you have to make adjustment. So actually China's adjustment or its, uh, its development strategy started a long time ago, more than 15 years ago. So uh, in, 19, uh, in, uh, uh, in 2019, in 2019, China's, uh, uh, China's uh, uh, total trade of GDP ratio uh, dropped to 32%. China's uh, export to GDP ratio dropped to 17%. China's uh, trade service less than 1%. Everybody hailed China's succeed in rebalancing its economy. This is China try to do. But now we have a new element in all this picture. That's Trump administration. Starting from two, 2017, they argued that China's uh, not enemy number one, but anyway, is uh, rival number one, competitor number one. And they tried their best to stop China to continue to open up. They raised tariffs. They stopped Chinese government, Chinese uh, uh, firms to list in, in, in stock, in New York stock exchanges. They stopped their, invest, their, their company to invest in China. They have done lots of things to try to kick China out of this global value chain. This is US comes, comes policy. You remember uh, uh, state secretary's open statement, Pompeo, he said that we should kick China out of its value chain. This is what uh, Trump, ministry, Trump administration has been doing for four years. So facing this kind of difficult situation, of course, China has to make further adjustment, of course. So 
why we emphasize the industrial policy, why we started to emphasize rely on domestic market, not because we like it, we was forced to do that. So if US really open to China, if US welcome China to join the global value chain, China will embrace this global value chain because we suffer greatly. We don't like it. This is a very, very bad political reality. So how, how, how can you ask China to still to embrace US economy, global value chain? Uh, how China to rely on supply of uh, uh, chips from US companies? We want to buy, but you don't sell. So this is a geopolitical problem, not as Chinese policy. So unfortunately, uh, some, I mean, fortunately, I should say, lots of American economists argue for allow China to continue its open policy. That's the right approach. People within China to argue for opening up was in very bad situation just because US government's policy. Okay, I should stop. Here. Can I come in right on this, precisely on what, what? Very, very uh, quickly, uh, Barry. Yeah, I mean, first of all, let me give absolute credit to Professor Yu, whose clear argumentation against the undervalued currency and excessive surplus back in 2007, we all remember very well and respect very much. It was an important part of correcting that serious imbalance. The Trump administration did a lot of bad things. But China's so-called innovation-driven development strategy was adopted in the middle of 2016 before Trump was elected president. And you read the preface to that strategy. What it says is, we're in a life and death technological competition, and we're going to push ahead in that life and death competition in order to prevail uh, in, the, in the global struggle. So to say that that started with Trump, I'm sorry, it's disingenuous. Okay. Can I? Uh, very, very brief, uh, Shannon. Yes. Very, first is I fully agree. I, I always call this dual circulation as rebalancing. I think the reba dual circulation caused a lot of uh, confusion. Uh, it, it is in fact, I think serves as rebalancing and uh, uh, create a domestic cons consumption led uh, economic growth. And uh, sorry, it does not second. say consumption led. Mm -hmm. The 14 five year plan never says consumption led. So that, I think that's, you know, in, in China, sometimes people like to create new terms, but the, the nature are, are rebalancing. And also about China's uh, development uh, of an innovation driven de development strategy, because it has for long been blamed as a copycat, you know, or even still other things, uh, other, other IPs. China want to be innovative and create knowledge and contribute to the world. And sometimes I think some rhetology, um, um, especially put in, in, the, in the medias, in the official medias may, may not really truly reflect what's the, 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 the main uh, objective or, or, or uh, objective or motivation. And for China to develop its innovation strategy really to contribute to the world. And, uh, and, uh, and rather than, you know, they don't want to be always an imitator. Um, so it's not really to, to, to beat others uh, and uh, to become the world's number one. It's really improve itself. Um, but I think sometimes the rhetology in the media um, kind of distorted the-, the, the Chinese media? Yeah, no, I China. honestly think that's just not right because, you know, I mean, there was a paper that the People's Bank of China wrote last week or the week before last. It was basically a paper on China's demography. I mean, it is a big kind of important issue. But in it, it's quite explicit to say, they, the authors say, and I assume they speak for the bank, um, uh, that, that China should specifically not follow a consumption strategy, that it actually is very important to be, to continue kind of what I think is a kind of a Leninist influence of uh, production and supply. I mean, that does describe the whole of the basis of China's macroeconomic policy. Um, I mean, if, if you really wanted to have a consumption strategy, you'd have extensive tax reform, um, you know, because of the, 
marginal role, peripheral role that income tax plays, for example, uh, which Barry referred to before. So I think this dual circulation strategy is not about rebalancing. I mean, I thought when I first saw it, it was a sort of a, an echo of what well, when Jabal had basically spoken about 10 years ago, but I don't think it is that at all. It's about very much about industrial policy and about, you know, um, uh, self-reliance. I mean, we've already spoken about this, but anyway, that's my okay. two minutes may, worth. May I respond? Um, I think <laughs> we need to, 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 move, to move on. This is a really good um, engagement in conversations. Thank you for that. I would like to give a bit of chance for uh, some of the questions that we have collected to be, to be air, and some of the issues may well come back. The first question I pick comes from uh, Jane Du, who is a SOAS research associate. Um, Jane says, since the, mid since the mid 2010s, Chinese society has adopted the new normal with a slower growth rate as a norm in the economy. If China is going to bypass the middle income trap, China will need a faster rate of growth than the new normal suggests. So she wonder how you feel China can actually break through the middle income trap under the policy of the new normal. Would either Professor Yu or Xiaolan want to get first? Xiaolan first. Okay. okay. Thank you. I think uh, the, trend, um, uh, the transition to a new normal, I think, means suggests that Chinese government has recognized the importance of the quality of growth rather than purely pursue the GDP growth, the, the, the growth figure. And it's also behind this is a structural change, uh, transition to a high quality growth, knowledge, uh, innovation driven, and also sustainable, environmentally sustainable uh, growth. And uh, for China, even this year, um, uh, for the government, the prime minister's uh, um, government report, it is not set up any GDP uh, target, growth target. I think this all suggests that the government is pursuing uh, a more sustainable growth uh, rather than um, purely pursue the GDP growth, growth ratio. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, uh... Okay, my response is that according to World Bank, middle income countries are uh, economies, uh, econ economy with a gross national income per capita between 1,000 to 12,000 something. This is the, by definition of a uh, World Bank. And China now is uh, about uh, 10,000. Okay, so uh, just uh, uh, 2,000 left for China to overcome this uh, uh, mid-income trap according to the definition of the World Bank. And China's uh, per capita income in 1979 was 200 US dollar, 200 US dollar. Okay, now I think it's more than uh, 11,000 US dollar this year, I guess, I guess, if I'm right. So this tremendous progress, so with the three or five years, definitely, I think uh, China's per capita income will be more than 12,000 US dollars. According to the World Bank's definition, China has, China will escape uh, so-called mid-income trap. Yeah, uh, the thing I'm is- I'm not that serious. Okay, I haven't finished. Uh, but my personal view is that I don't agree with the, uh, the phrase of a new normal. I think China should continue to try its best to achieve its achieve a high growth rate, which in which is in, in, in compatible with its potential growth rate. My view is that China's potential growth growth rate is six percent. Why? Because we have uh, China now is suffer overcapacity. China's inflation rate has been low for many years, and China's PPI has been in negative territory for many, many months. For example, from 2012, uh, five, 40, uh, 54 months 
inactive uh, territory. And also since uh, last the year before last year, went into negative territory. Only recently it's going up, become positive. So China definitely has higher potential growth than six than six percent. But okay, uh, I mean uh, on the safe side, on the safe side, let's assume that China's potential growth rate is five percent. I I don't think there's anyone within China. You against this assumption, five percent or four percent, you can calculate by how many years chance per capita income will surpass the definition given by World Bank. So it's not a question. But I entirely agree with the George argument. China need physical reform. China's Gini coefficient is too high. There are lots of problems. I think this is something China really has to do. I agree with you entirely in this regard. Okay, thank you. George? Oh, just briefly, I mean, I, I don't think that, well, I, I obviously I don't think that's right. I think that China's potential growth rate, if it is 6%, is dependent on rates of debt creation, which are just unsustainable. So if you, you know, it, it's important not to disentangle the relationship between growth and debt and the incurrence of debt, because if you slow down the incurrence of debt, you're going to slow down economic growth. If you slow down um, and, and that's kind of what we want to see. We don't want to see China uh, you have kind a of erupt. Higher delivery <laughs> um, the, the other thing is, of course, that you know it, it's not going to be kind of a smooth transition. As I said, I mean, we we talked a little bit about balance sheets constraints, which are something which are things that all countries run into at some point if they have you know continued uh, economic expansions and over leverage, and and China exhibits many of these. Uh, attributes. So there will be a period of time when things will kind of grind to a halt again. And um, I suspect that that will have some bearing. But my, my main point really about the middle income trap, which is obviously a, the, the numbers move over time, because middle income today is not the same as it was 25 or 35 years ago. But I mean, the, the point about I make about middle income is that it's to avoid the trap. It's really about having good institutions, flexible institutions that allow productivity um, and to, to, to rise and allow companies and workers to operate at higher levels of efficiency. Um, so it's not really about GDP growth specifically. You could presumably have very high GDP growth, which is a, a lot of it is uncommercial and it really won't do, as a country, it wouldn't really do you any good. So I want to see more uh, political reform. I mean, I'm not terribly optimistic to be honest, but I want to see more political reform to be more optimistic about China being able to avoid getting stuck in this middle income area. Okay. Okay. Let me, we have, I think about 12 minutes left and I would like to keep sort of the last five minutes so that I can ask you to each uh, one very quick question response for one minute. Let me move on to the next question, which is a bit more on the political side. It comes from Jonathan Fenby. Jonathan would like to ask, Will the Communist Party's political power priority always stand in the weight of economic liberalization and the strengthening of institutions? Who would like to go first? Uh, okay. Uh, even though I'm not uh, a, a student for uh, political science, uh, science, but uh, I think I can answer this question uh, uh, very uh, frankly. Uh, I, I don't think really China's economic growth, uh, economic growth uh, or the question of whether China will be able to uh, escape uh, so-called middle income trap really uh, depends on whether there's so-called the democracy. Uh, actually, uh, of course, we like freedom and so on and so forth, especially uh, me as a person educated in Oxford, so so understand all these sort of things. No question about that. But we should not uh, uh, forget that. Uh, so far, there's only one country which you may call a democracy that was able to break through the middle income trap. This country, guess what, is Korea. However, we should not forget the fact that this democracy was ruled by three gener generals in a row for 32 years. 
who seized the power by military coups. It was these unpopular generals rather than elected politicians, civil servants like uh, Mr. Jim Hacker or Sir Humphrey who enabled Korea, Korea to escape the middle income trap. I think we should remember all those, those things. Situation is not that simple. I think 10 years ago, 20 years ago, I was very simple, red, uh, black and white, so on and I think uh, for country, for developed country, conditions for escape middle income trap is much more complicated, nuanced, nuanced and the country specific. I think that's very important. I'm not going to draw any conclusion, but I want to say that when we are checking this sort of thing, we must be very, very careful. Okay. Um, but, but so let me disagree with that completely. Um, I do think the Communist Party prevents the growth of the institutions that George is talking about. And Korea is a perfect example. When Korea got to the stage where China is now, it democratized. It shifted the, the initiative for technological change and market development away from the government and towards companies. Now, of course, they had very big, robust, strong companies, but you can't help but notice that the time pattern is exactly the opposite in this successful, earlier developing economy of Korea. And I guess I would, I would wanna just plug it in directly to a very, very practical question. Let's look at electric vehicle industrial policy. How does that relate to these big issues about you know, Communist Party and civil society? Well, China had a, you know, five years of electric vehicle industrial policy that failed completely. $100 billion was wasted, targets weren't met, people were unhappy. So China revised its EV industrial policy. It lowered subsidies, made it more fair, allowed foreign companies to participate. That's great, right? China can have a more inclusive industrial policy that people in the world can be happy about. But what's going on right now? a propaganda campaign against Tesla because supposedly their vehicles aren't high enough quality, even though independent surveys in China show that consumers in China think Tesla has the best quality of every EV that's sold in China. The political power of the Communist Party is distorting the ability of the government to run a fair and effective industrial policy. Sorry, Barry, I entirely disagree. I entirely disagree. Who introduced uh, be, be this? Be very, very quick. Uh, to China? This is the Communist Party of Shanghai government. They introduced it. Who accused this car industry, car maker? Some uh, netizens, netizens. They are not representing the government. Actually, they were criticized by lots of government agencies. I so didn't say government, I said party. Complicated. The party Very apparatus, mega No, I don't agree. I'm in China. I'm in China. I think I know better. That's very complicated. Okay. Some party members dislike it. Others like it. We are debating at this moment. Okay. Okay, I don't, I don't think we're going to get um, either Yongding or Barry to agree on this point, but let me bring Xiaoning in. Yeah, I... I... First, my, my first point is that China is a big country. Uh, it's difficult to use, you know, one cases to represent the whole uh, country or one group or one region. I think that's the complication of China. Um, it's like, you know, there was someone asking me, who owns China? Is it state capitalism? I said, definitely no. But we also see the private capital. We see global capital all uh, in China. They just thrive in different parts, different industries, different regions. I think that's the complexity of China. I agree with Barry that China should forget the old fashioned industrial policy uh, and uh, adopt a more modern a uh, horizontal industrial policy that built infrastructure networks and capabilities, et cetera. And however, 
I disagree about concentration of government power in R&D. Um, this is, you know, um, Barry is a great expert about China, but I think this still kind of um, captured some super surfaces, especially those come from the media, media propaganda. But actually look at China, there are very vivid, uh, the private sector, we see the venture capitalists very vivid. And also we see the new startups like in Shenzhen or in Shanghai, uh, the Yang River Delta, et cetera. So Chinese uh, have a mix of different uh, sectors are playing there. And um, in terms of R&D uh, and the innovation, although the state, now we see the state have two routes to, 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 to engage. One is uh, investment in basic science uh, and the uh, uh, R&D infrastructure uh, in research and development, and another way through SOEs. However, number of SOEs in the Chinese economy, I think Barry knows better than me, is now a very small proportion. And also they are highly concentrated in a few sectors, like, you know, those are natural monopoly sector, banking or energy or, or telecommunication, et cetera. So, but in many of the, 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 the uh, um, natural competition, more perfect competition industries, uh, like in textile or apparel, you, can't, you cannot find any SOEs in those industry. Um, so I think in China, um, we cannot overestimate the role of China, uh, the government played in, in, in innovation and R&D. Although from newspaper, you may see only, you know, uh, uh, more, more is dominant. However, on the ground, uh, the private sector and also the multinationals, despite the trade war, the US multinational, German multinational, European multinational, they all still are very active in China and the private capital the, the going into China, China received the largest amount of foreign direct, inward foreign direct investment last year. So this private sector, we, we should not under, underestimate it. That's okay, all. Th thank you. We have less than three minutes left. So if I may, um, I will go around the panel and ask each one of you, in the course of the last hour and a half or so, having heard the arguments from your colleagues, have you in any way changed your assessment about the economic sustainability of China and China's capacity to rise further economically? Uh, I'll go with Barry first and then I'll ask each one of you exactly the same questions, and if you could respond in, say, 30 to 40 seconds. Thank you. Uh, Barry. No, I haven't heard anything that changed my views, but I do recognize that, that there is an existing trade war, and it's not simple for China to, to, to do things that would seem like concessions. So we, the best we can hope for is a gradual process of signaling, trust building, and moving back towards uh, some opening, which would not be easy. Okay, uh, Shaolan. Uh, no, I have not changed my basic uh, conclusion. Uh, I think China can do better if they can address the challenges that George and Barry pointed out. Uh, China can do even better. And I think China's rise, I, I really think so is the will of history. Um, yeah, I think that the, the direction is going this way, yeah. Okay, thank you. George? Gosh, if we knew what the will of history was, then we'd all be very clever and rich. Um, but I think, uh, no, I haven't, uh, you won't be surprised for me here that I've, uh, I haven't changed my mind. I, you know, I think I've come back to something that we kind of talked about right at the very beginning, which is that I think certainly from kind of an economic and kind of commercial background, I think we all understand, you know, what makes things work and how systems function and how they misfunct or you know, dis become dysfunctional. Um, but I think that um, what's what's really missing in terms of what I've heard from my opponents, shall we say, on this uh, discussion, is uh, a convincing argument that um, that um, the, the you know the political and governance system which is leading towards this dysfunction. Uh, is something that we don't have to worry about. I think we do have to worry about it. I think China should worry about it. Thank you. And Yongding? Uh, my view is similar uh, 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 with uh, Xiaolian's. I haven't changed my mind at all. 
but uh, I appreciate the, the criticism uh, given by, by Barry and uh, George. I think uh, their uh, voice is, uh, is really uh, important for us to listen, to learn, to try our best to uh, accommodate. But I also want to emphasize that China now is facing a very different international environment compared with say 10 or 20 years ago. So even though China want to continue the policy adopted, adopted by Deng Xiaoping, by uh, Jiang Zemin, by uh, uh, Hu Yaobang, China has to make some adjustment, not because we want to make or not, just because we are facing different United States. Well, thank you very much, Professor Yu from Beijing, George from London, Shaoland from Oxford, and Barry from San Diego in California. It's been fantastic to have your discussions. I think none of us were surprised that you have not changed your views on the subject. China is going to be a very big subject that will continue to engage us and will divide us in terms of how we understand it the more reasons that we need to have a lot more conversations and a lot more debates about different subjects of China. So thank you all very much. I look forward to seeing some of you again, hopefully physically at SOAS next year at our next China debate. Thank you. Goodbye. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Steve. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.